Okay, Galatians, Galatians for Beginners, the name of the series. This is lesson number five in that series. Title of this lesson, Paul Confronts Peter. Paul Confronts Peter. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking at Galatians chapter two. So if you want to follow along in your Bibles, Galatians chapter two, that's where we'll be. And as always, we'll be putting up the scriptures on the uh, screen. So, uh, so far in this, uh, in this epistle, Paul the Apostle, who's the uh, author of the epistle, um, is defending himself against accusations that somehow he has changed the gospel in order to make it more palatable to Gentiles by removing certain commands concerning specifically um, circumcision. That's, that's, the, that's the accusation he's facing, and that's what he's defending against. His accusers, the Judaizers, remember those people? The Judaizers, they were charging that they and the true apostles, like Peter in Jerusalem, they were teaching the original gospel which included circumcision and certain law keeping and so on and so forth. So in describing his past association with Peter and the other apostles, Paul demonstrates that they have always been supportive and in agreement with the gospel that he preaches, not the one that is promoted by the Judaizers. And of course, in this day and age, you couldn't get away with this kind of business here. Because one phone call, right? One phone call is, is hello, Peter? Is Paul, you know, is that what he's doing? Let me text you, is this what? But in those days, news traveled slowly. And so they could promote something like this, okay? I mean, they're in the province of Galatia, you know, way you know, far from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and they seemed uh, honest, they seemed uh, uh, you know, educated, these men. They were, uh, they were uh, you know, knowledgeable of uh, the word and so on and so forth. So if they were discrediting Paul uh, and saying at the same time, you know, a thousand miles from home, well, Peter back in Jerusalem, he agrees with us. There was no way to fact check that. And so they were getting away with this. And then the, that word was spreading from one congregation to another. Imagine, you know, for a moment, put yourself in the position of Paul having to defend against this type of thing. Right? He, he couldn't get on a plane and fly out and you know, visit three or four of those congregations you know, in a weekend, solve the problem, have, call, a, call a, 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 a video conference, get all the people involved. It's pretty slow going in those days. So he, he does something, he writes a letter. And that's the letter that we're, that we're studying. So in chapter two of this letter, verse 11 to 21, Paul, um, even goes further to recount a time when even Peter himself was untrue to the gospel and Paul had to correct him in defense of the pure message of salvation in Christ Jesus by faith. You know, the point being, he's saying, you people are saying Paul, uh, Peter agrees with you and this is how you are you know, confirming your teaching. And I'm telling you that Peter always agreed with my teaching every time I met with him and the apostles. As a matter of fact, even when Peter, the one that you people are putting all your chips on, even when that Peter you know, was not acting properly in accordance to the gospel, I, Paul, confronted him about this. So that's the context of why he's you know, telling the story about the time that he confronted Peter, okay? So let's look at verse 11. He says, chapter 2, 11, he says, but when Cephas, right, we know that's Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. So Paul establishes the place and the seriousness of the problem. Because of his error in judgment on the matter of the gospel, even Peter, I mean, Peter stood condemned. Now, in an incident which, we, uh, which Paul is going to describe a little bit later on here, uh, he said that he opposed Peter publicly. Now, let me make just a little you know, side commentary here. 
The very fact that in the Bible an inspired writer explains and tells a story where Peter himself was in error concerning the gospel, that passage and this story alone should disqualify all others who depend on this idea of apostolic succession and the infallibility of the Pope. See what I'm saying? There's no basis in the New Testament for the, first of all, succession you know, of one bishop to another all the way down to Peter, and even less for the argument that the Pope, when he speaks, as they say, in ex cathedra, meaning from the chair of Peter, there's no basis in the Bible to support the idea that when the Pope uh, speaks in this way that he is infallible. I mean, Peter himself made a mistake concerning the most important thing, which was the gospel. All right, just a little aside there. Verse 12, it says, for prior to the coming of certain men from James, he, meaning Peter, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof fearing the party of the circumcision. That was the other term referring to these people, the Judaizers who taught this and the people who agreed and promoted this idea that you had to become a Jew first before you could become um, a Christian. So Peter visited Antioch. The thing about Antioch, it was a congregation where you had both Jewish and Gentile individuals in one congregation. And this letter is being sent to these people among others. While there, Peter mingled and he ate with Gentiles, which Christians were free to do, but unconverted Jews were not. Remember when Peter went to Cornelius' home you know, to preach the gospel to him? He even said, you know, we're not allowed to be in your home, but I had a vision. I had, you know, God spoke to me and sent me to you. Otherwise, I wouldn't have entered your house. You're a Gentile. So Peter had contact with Gentiles before. He was the first one to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And so when he goes to Antioch, he has no problem mingling, sitting at the same table, eating with uh, Gentiles. Now Paul mentions certain men from James, probably means Jewish Christians from Jerusalem who were associates of James, um, who also we're going to visit Antioch after Peter had arrived. So when Peter finds this out, he's afraid that they might report to the church in Jerusalem that he was associating with Gentiles in Antioch. And he was afraid that when Judaizers learned of this, they would cause problems for Peter when he returned. You know, the last thing I need, you know, I'm just imagining, uh, Last thing I need is go back to Jerusalem and have this big headache with these Judaizers making accusations and causing trouble. So Peter feels, well, maybe I should just be discreet, pull back you know, while these people are here and so on and so forth. So Peter's reaction was to withdraw from the Gentiles, not to eat or mingle with them anymore, especially while these people from Jerusalem we're there. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 13. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. So his action prompted other Jewish Christians to do the very same thing. And even Barnabas, now here's the, here's the really strange thing about Barnabas. I mean, Barnabas was the one who helped Paul establish churches among the Gentiles in Galatia. I mean, he's like the last person in the world who ought to be, you know, fall into this trap here, into this hypocrisy. Um, so this, this you know, what Peter and the others was, were doing um, was very dangerous for a number of reasons. Number one, it gave power to the Judaizers who were promoting this false gospel. It was legitimizing their, you know, their, their issue, their question. Also, it was building up a wall between Jew and Gentile in the church, a division. And this was a wall that Christ tore down so that everyone could be one in Christ. You know, neither Jew, nor Greek, nor slave, nor free, nor male, nor female. You know, everybody, you know, God, Jesus came to knock those walls down so that we can all be united 
equally valuable, equally saved in exactly the same way in Christ Jesus. And then thirdly, a respected leader takes the first step back into legalism and what does he do? Well, he draws others back with him. So in verse 14, Paul says, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? When he says live like Jews, he means keeping the law, the rituals, the food laws, all that stuff. He's saying, you, you don't do this. You don't do this anymore. And by your actions, you're forcing these people to, you know, to carry a burden that you've just, you've taken off of yourself. So uh, Paul confronts Peter publicly about his hypocrisy. Peter was condemning what he himself practiced because of fear of criticism. Peter was not bound by law and traditions being promoted by the Judaizer, by the Judaizers, but by his separation from the Gentiles, he was supporting the idea that the Gentiles should. I don't have to do it, but you people have to do it, no. So Paul reviews the basis of the argument that he made to Peter and the rest of the church at Antioch at that confrontation in verse 15 and 16. He says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So here he's making a parenthetical statement. He's explaining why this is hypocrisy. He begins by explaining that even the Jews who were the chosen people of God, unlike the Gentiles who were in total darkness, even the Jews recognized that salvation was obtained through Christ and not through law. So what was the ideological conflict between Paul and the Judaizers concerning the law? What was it? Well, Paul believed and taught the true purpose of the law, meaning the commandments, you know, the Ten Commandments, including the ceremonial and the sacrificial laws. He was explaining that all of these laws were there to reveal sin and how God dealt with sin. And his reference here is something he wrote in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. He says, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So the giving of the law by God was not an end unto itself but rather a step in God's overall plan to save man. Here is where the law fitted in. God created man righteous. In other words, when Adam was created, he was good, he was acceptable to God. Man then sinned and became unrighteous, which caused ignorance of God, among other things, and physical death. God then planned to save man from ignorance and death. But before this could happen, the Lord had to bring man to a certain point of understanding. Because you see, because of his sin, man, his, his mind was darkened. He didn't have the relationship with God. He didn't understand who God was anymore. You even see it in the garden immediately after the sin. They hid from God. They were afraid. They blamed each other. They, they, they completely lost contact with who God was. So God has to reintroduce Himself back to man. So man is sinful, becomes unrighteous, causes him to be blinded as to who God really is. So God plans to save man from his ignorance and his death. Again, before this could happen, 
He had to bring man to a certain point of understanding. And what was that understanding? Well, first of all, he had to reintroduce himself to man. In other words, who God really is. Because after the fall, man went into idolatry. He was worshiping rocks and trees and the sun and whatever. Secondly, he had to reveal to man why he was in the condition of ignorance and death that he experienced. In other words, he had to show man what sin was and how it had affected him. And then of course, he had to reveal to man who he was going to send and how he was going to save him. Now, we're looking, you know, hindsight. We have all this information. Most of us here have been taught this from an early age. But imagine you don't have this information at all. You don't know who God is. You don't know why you're in the condition you're in. You have no idea what hope you have. So God has to do all these things you know, slowly. So God begins this process of education by first revealing Himself to just a few men. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, just a few men. And then through, He reveals Himself through, to an entire nation through Moses. See how you know, he's expanding the amount of people who begin to know him from the patriarchs to Moses to the nation. Next, he began to reveal to man the reason and the result of his condition. That's where the law comes in. That's where the commandments come in. That's where the sacrificial system comes in. That's where the ceremonies come in. This is where the law came in to reveal and to demonstrate what sin was, what sin did, and how God was going to deal with it. How was God going to deal with it? Well, through a sacrificial system that pointed eventually to a sacrifice once for all. So once man had learned from the law that sin causes spiritual blindness and death, once man learned from the law that God deals with sin, through the method of atonement, meaning a life exchanged for another life. For centuries it was animal life. Don't you think the Jews kind of understood finally how God was going to deal with sin? Well, apparently not because they rejected the Savior, but some, some believed, some understood, right? And then he was prepared man was prepared to recognize two very important things once he understood all of this. Number one, he was ready to understand that he was a sinner and it was his own sins that condemned him. And number two, the final sacrifice for sin was going to be the perfect life of Jesus. Not a perfect animal sacrifice, the perfect life of his son. So the righteousness that man had at creation in Adam was recreated again in Jesus. And just as all shared in Adam's fallen nature because we were all physical descendants of Adam, all could now share in the righteous nature of Jesus Christ through union with Him by faith. If I want to kind of summarize that, I would do it this way. We were connected to Adam by flesh and therefore we shared his sin. We're now connected to Jesus by faith, and now we share His perfection. So Paul taught that man was saved because he shared in the righteousness of Christ through faith. And the law served to reveal our unrighteousness and the way that Jesus would deal with it. Death on the cross, atonement. So that's what Paul was teaching. That, you know, that's the essence of the gospel. The Pharisees, when they used the term law, they included all of the man-made traditions that had grown up around the law. Remember I told, I told you last time, you know, the hedge around the law, there was the law, and then there were these 600 and odd rules around the law to help you not break the law. When they said the law, they included all, everything. Okay? The law given by God plus all the rules and regulations created by the, by the scribes over the centuries. Now in many instances they used a watered down 
perverted view of the law to establish their own righteousness. This is very important, this point. I want you to really kind of grasp this. The key point in Romans 10, 3, let me just show you that one. It says, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they, meaning the Jews, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. How do you subject yourself to the righteousness of God? Well, by being, <laughs> having faith in Christ. You become righteous through faith. So he's talking about, in Romans 10, he's talking about why didn't the Jews make it? Why did these Gentiles that didn't have the law, didn't have the prophets, nothing, they got it, they understood. Why didn't the Jews who had the law, who had the prophets, who had the fathers, the Messiah was a Jew, they had everything going for them. Why did they miss the boat? Well, in Romans 10.3 he explains, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. How did they establish their own righteousness? They watered down the law. Okay. They didn't see the law as something to reveal sin. They saw it as something that would help them conquer sin. They claimed that they already were righteous in God's eyes for two reasons. One, they were the chosen people of God. Come on. And number two, they obeyed the law. The problem with this self view was that in reality, they were chosen to be the people through whom Christ would come in order to deal with sin. But they were not simply chosen arbitrarily as saved people. They had to, they had to believe too. And then the second false notion they had was that they obeyed their version of the law. But Jesus showed how shallow their concept of the law really was. That's what the Sermon on the Mount's all about. For example, adultery for the Jew at that time. Adultery was, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, right? There's the commandment. In their minds, adultery was sex with the legitimate wife of a fellow Jew. That was adultery. If you had sex with a single woman, that wasn't adultery. You had sex with a slave, that was not adultery. That's what, or you, you divorced without cause, that wasn't adultery. Some even went so far as to say, it's adultery if I have sex with the legitimate wife of another Jew in my tribe. <laughs> really? And so a man would say to a Pharisee or one of these individuals would say, I keep the law, I keep the commandment. You know, I was getting tired of my wife, so I just, I divorced her. I gave her the piece of paper. Moses said, give her the piece of paper. And I just, you know, I married myself another one. And I didn't like her, I got rid of her, and I got myself a third one. I'm good. I gave the paper. I have sex with a slave. That's okay. She's not the wife of a, a fellow Jew. So there was this self-righteousness based on a obedience of a watered down version of the law. So Jesus comes along. Don't ask why they hated him. <laughs> Jesus comes along and he says, oh, you have heard that it has been said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Oh, and they go, yeah, sure, the law, absolutely. But I say to you, even if you look at a woman and lust after her in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Whoa, <laughs> that's a much tougher law to obey for your whole life, right? So every time you see Jesus, say, you, have heard that it, you, know, you have heard that it was said such and such, he's challenging them. Okay, here's your law. Now here's how to really obey that law. This is why they despised him. He was blowing up their false self-righteousness according to the law. And so the Pharisees, and now the Judaizers, who were Pharisees who had become Christians, they wanted to introduce a system whereby 
a, a, a man could achieve righteousness by obeying certain laws. And the main one, the kickoff law, you know, the point, what, the tipping point, if you wish, was the law about circumcision. If you could get one of these people to receive circumcision, then it was nothing to get them to, to take the food laws and no pork and blah, 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 you know, the whole rest of it. So for these Judaizers, Christ was like Moses. He just gave a different set of laws. They saw the Sermon on the Mount like laws. Paul maintained that in living a perfect life and offering it on the cross, Jesus obeyed the entire law on our behalf. That's how it works. Brothers and sisters, that's why they call it good news. <laughs> Once you realize the absolute demands of God's law and how woefully short we come, no matter how hard we try to obey it, then the gospel really is good news. Wait a minute, Jesus came and He perfectly obeyed the law on our behalf. That's good news. We become obedient to that law in the same way, not by keeping every command, because we can't. We become obedient completely to the law by being united to Jesus by faith. Yeah. No room for boasting there. No room for bragging there. Nobody can brag. So both Paul and the Judaizers, they had the same objective to be perfect and thus saved. Their method was obeying the commands one by one by one by one until you obeyed all of them perfectly. That was their method. Paul's method, or God's method, was sharing Jesus' perfection by faith. That was the gospel's way. And trust me, when you, when you understand and accept that, it's a very humbling thing. Why do you think Isaiah says, you know, their righteousness are like filthy rags? Meaning, if we put forth before God our goodness, our righteousness, our puny attempts to obey the law and claim some sort of righteousness, Isaiah is saying that that's like, those are like dirty rags. So in verse 17, he says, but if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. And so in defending this way, Paul asks the questions. Do we sin by trying to be justified through faith rather than through law? Is that wrong? Because in the end, this is what the Judaizers were saying. The Judaizers were saying, oh, you people are, you're obeying some watered down type of gospel. Too easy. It's too easy. It's too easy. People will abuse that. I've heard that even in the church. People say, oh, well, that's, that, that gospel is way too easy. That's cheap grace. It's not cheap grace. By its very nature, grace is free. <laughs> So if this is so, he says, we make Christ to be the one who leads us into sin because he's the one who says to believe in him. And Paul says, well, heaven forbid. In other words, Jesus' way to be saved through faith, we're not sinning if we follow that way. It's the Judaizers who are sinning by taking us in the other direction. Verse 18, how are we on time? Good. It says, for if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. In other words, if he reestablishes the system of salvation by works of the law that he removed when he accepted Christ, two things automatically happen. Number one, he will be condemned by the very laws that he is reestablishing. This system only condemns, it cannot save. And number two, Christ will also condemn him for abandoning the true way of salvation, which is by faith in Christ. 
I believe, I not only believe intellectually as true the things that Jesus says, that He's the Son of God and so on and so forth, I also believe in the sense that I trust, I have confidence that He saves me through union with Him by faith. I, I trust you, Lord. You've told me that you have lived up to the law perfectly and you give to me freely that type of righteousness as if I have also lived up to the law. I trust you that this is true. That when I come before God in judgment, I shall not be judged because I have your perfection given freely to me through faith. Either way, if I leave that system, I'll be a transgressor. Verse 19, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live to Christ. So Paul declares that when he understood the true purpose of the law, which was to reveal sin, and saw his true sinfulness and condemnation under the law, he stopped trying to use the law as a means of saving himself. In other words, he died to the law. That's what that expression means. And so he says he did this so he could be saved by Christ. So this is a, what's called parallelism. It's a, it's, a, um, it's a literary device used mainly in the Psalms, but in other places. You know, the, uh, an idea is, is stated in one line and then in the next line the same idea is stated but in different words. And then other types of, uh, uh, other types of um, parallelism, you have one idea in this line and then you have the opposite idea in the second line. So the, it's, it's, it was a, a literary device that, that, that was used in that time. Okay? So he uses this literary device so the imagery of him dying to the law and then living to God. He's talking about the same thing, except he's using, you know, he's comparing that. A wonderful parallel to what he says in the next verse, where he repeats the very same idea, but now he uses different imagery. This time his death is on the cross and his life is the resurrected one with Jesus, right? He says, I've been crucified with Christ. Well, there, there's his death to the law. And it is no, lo no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. In other words, I'm able to live and breathe, not just physically my heart pumping the blood, I'm able to live before God and not feel worthless and sinful and a failure. I, I'm alive in front of Him, why? Because I know that through faith, He accepts me as perfect. So, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. What's He doing? Well, he, the gospel. He's just repeating the gospel in another way. So the new Paul, righteous, perfect, saved, has Christ's presence in Himself experienced in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? Acts 2.38, we receive the indwelling of the Spirit at baptism. So you die in baptism and then you resurrect with Christ living in you. Everything now done with His flesh is not done to earn righteousness through law keeping, but rather a response of trusting faith in a Savior who loved and died in His place in order to give Him perfection and thus saved him. So there's the pair. Died with Christ, Christ now lives with me, within me. There's the other example of parallelism. So previous acts done as works of law, they were burdens, they were discouraging, they produced false pride. Now, however, the very same things done as a response of faith are acceptable to God and joyful to do, and they produce humility. Very same actions, very same things. I try to, I a man, try to have a sexually pure mind and heart. 
Okay, as every Christian man should, right? Okay. If I'm under the law, I'm making an attempt and I see that sometimes I win and sometimes I lose and sometimes I win and then three other times I lose. That's pretty discouraging. I got to keep trying. I got to keep trying because you know, the law has a, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, no impurities. I got to keep trying, but it's so discouraging. If I'm in Christ, I have the same responsibility as a Christian man to have a pure mind and heart, except now I'm doing it as an act of faith. Sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't. But everything I do is a way to say to God, I believe. I keep trying, why? Because I believe. I keep trying, why? Because I love you, Lord. I've failed five times out of seven. Well, you know, the two times I've succeeded, Lord, here it is. Because you're not going to judge me based on my perfection. You're going, to you're going to judge me based on my faith. But my faith continues to push me forward in making an effort to live a righteous life, to tell the truth, not to grumble at others who you know, get on my nerves. Some of the people in this very room. Uh, <laughs> you know who you are, Steve. So in verse 21, he says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Paul is not the one eliminating the grace of God. Peter and the Judaizers, they're the ones that are eliminating the grace of God. Why? They're trying to go back to the old system. If righteousness could be had this way, then Christ died for nothing. In other words, if you could be righteous by obeying the law, well, then Jesus died for nothing, why should He come? God did not send Him to die for some sins. He came to, for all the sins of everyone. So His death pays for all sin or no sin. It's one or the other. You either accept perfection through union with Christ based on faith, or you pursue it through perfect law keeping. Those are the only choices that you have. The only choices that you have. It's one or the other, but it cannot be both. The problem here and in all churches since is that many people try to mix these two systems and we end up with various forms of legalism, even to this day. So Paul mentions nothing more of Peter here or anywhere else, as a matter of fact. So we assume that Peter received the correction, he adjusted his position, and his later letters seem to confirm this. Imagine one apostle rebuking another, and the other receiving the rebuke, changing his attitude. Okay, so next time uh, we're going to look, righteousness not, not comes by faith, but next time we're also going to look at other things that he talks about that also come with faith, not just righteousness, other things too are based on faith. All right, that's it for this particular lesson. Thank you very much.